Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, I'm Jocelyn Kennedy, the Executive Director of the Harvard Law School Library. Welcome to the Law School Library Faculty Book Talk Series. We're so glad you're here with us. This talk is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel. You can check out our scholarship at Law Blog for more information. We want to take a minute to thank Dean Manning for his generous support of these talks. And a really big thank you to our team, Maya Bergamasco, Anna Martin, Rachel Parker, Debbie Ginsburg, and Teresa Knapp for putting together this series. We welcome your questions um, of our author and panelists today and invite you to use the Q&A feature throughout the talk. Time is reserved at the end for our um, folks to engage with your questions. So also please visit your local library, your local bookseller, including the Harvard Law Coop for a copy of today's book, The Broken Constitution, Lincoln, Slavery, and the Refounding of America. It's my pleasure to introduce today's author, Noah Feldman, and our panelist, Nicholas Bowie. Professor Feldman is the Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law and founding director of the Julius Reinowitz Program on Jewish and Israeli Law. He specializes in constitutional studies with particular emphasis on power and ethics, design of innovative governance solutions, law and religion, and the history of legal ideas. Nicholas Bowie is an assistant professor of law here at the law school. He's a historian who teaches courses on federal and state constitutional law and local government law. His research focuses on critical legal histories of democracy in the United States. And he has written about the exclusion of workers in corporate governance, the exclusion of immigrants from constitutional governance and the relationship between self-government, written constitutions and judicial review. With that introduction, I turn it over to Professor Feldman to get us started. Looking forward to the talk today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, and thank you to the library, which I owe not only a debt of gratitude for hosting us today and for this great series, but also for helping me so much uh, in the research for this book. Um, the librarians at, at Harvard's Law School Library are always incredibly helpful in every book I've worked on, but this time we were in COVID, so they could never say to me, you know, go to the stacks and find the book yourself. They had to do it all themselves and um, produce all kinds of documents. Um, and they did it magically uh, and in many cases remotely themselves. So I, I really want to express gratitude. Uh, I also really want to thank uh, Nico, um, one of my most brilliant colleagues and uh, the, the next and better generation of historians of the constitution uh, for taking the time for, to be in conversation with me. So thank you for that in advance, Nico. Um, the, let me say a few words about the book, but just to generate the conversation. Um, the, the book is called The Broken Constitution, Lincoln, Slavery, and the Refounding of America. And I wrote it for two reasons. One reason is that I've been trying over the course of my time in constitutional law teaching, which is now almost 20 years, to write in installments, slightly out of order, the history of the U.S. Constitution in ideas, with the ideas being ideas told through actual human beings. And so um, not in the order that I wrote them, but in the order that they work logically, the first book was a book about James Madison, who was the lead drafter of the Constitution of 1787. Uh, and that book took us uh, through the War of 1812. This book, which picks up just around the same time and continues until just the very end of the Civil War. Um, then there's a gap for a book that I haven't written yet. And then another book picked up in the 1920s and followed FDR's great Supreme Court justices and got them until about 1960. So as you can see, I owe at least one and maybe two more books uh, on those subjects, but that was one reason I wanted to write this book. I knew that this central part of the US constitutional history was radically different than other parts. And I really wanted to dig more deeply into it. The second is that um, in the time that I was starting the research for the book, the national debate about how we should think of our constitution with respect to the legacy of white supremacy and slavery was becoming even more prevalent in public debate than it had been previously. And the 1619 project was part of what drove that conversation. And that conversation over the course of time that I was working on the book and then now in the time that I'm publishing it has just gotten more intense, more serious, and also more intensely politicized, which um, uh, was always the case in certain respects, but it's become partisan politicized right now. Um, you know, as we speak, we just came through off season or off year gubernatorial elections and at least one possible interpretation of the election of a Republican governor 
in Virginia, defeating a Democratic incumbent, was that um, in the Northern Virginia, mostly white suburbs, um, voters may have been, again, this is just a possible interpretation, affected by um, the suggestion that the schools would somehow be teaching, quote, critical race theory, which is not something that most people, including the people who might be voting on that basis, know what it is, uh, and nor is it the thing that the 1619 Project particularly is associated with. There's a series of misnomers and misunderstandings there. But nevertheless, I'm just pointing to it to suggest that the debate over what our constitution means for race and in our country, past, present, and future, is as live an issue as it has ever been. And as I'm going to suggest, it was a very live issue in the period that I'm writing about, uh, the period leading up to the uh, to the breaking of the U.S. Constitution and its remaking in the aftermath of the Civil War. So I'll just state really simply, and I wanted to know about that too. And so that's the other reason that I that I did the research for the book. I'll just state the thesis of the book pretty simply, and it's this. The Constitution of 1787 was a compromised constitution. That's a term that was often used starting in the 1840s to describe it by abolitionists who were really against that constitution. And it was a compromise of various kinds, but the most central compromise came to be the compromise over slavery. And there were three provisions of the constitution that made that compromise explicit, many more that were implicit, but the explicit ones were the guarantee that the international slave trade would remain in place for 20 more years, the three-fifths compromise, and the Fugitive Slave Clause, which guaranteed that states that did not have slavery on the books as lawful would nevertheless return enslaved people who escaped to those states to slavery and thereby required those states to acknowledge a constitutional protection of the institution of slavery. And it's just worth mentioning in context here, because it's not in most people's eighth grade civics, that um, in 1772, the Court of King's Bench in the UK uh, had decided an opinion by a very influential common law judge called uh, Judge Mansfield or Lord Mansfield that a, an enslaved person who had been brought from Jamaica to Britain, to England, was no longer a slave by virtue of being in England because England did not have a positive written law on the books that put slavery into action. And so the Fugitive Slave Clause was, among other things, uh, an attempt, a successful attempt by the Southern states to insist that the Northern states repudiate that idea by saying that if an enslaved person should be in their territory, he would nevertheless, or she would nevertheless remain enslaved. That is to say that constitutional and property law principles of slavery would still uh, be sustained and maintained in the North. It was a known fact at the time that this was a compromise and Alexander Hamilton speaking at the New York State Ratifying Convention, openly referred to these provisions as a, quote, accommodation, close quote, or a compromise, without which he said the Constitution would never have been put into place. This wasn't a secret. And I should add that although Hamilton was not quite the abolitionist that Lin-Manuel Miranda's amazing musical would have you think that he was, um, he was not sympathetic as a general matter to slavery. So for him to say this, acknowledge very much the thinking of Northern anti-slavery elites at the time, namely that they had reached a compromise over slavery, which served their interests. That second claim of the book is that, and this is not maybe particularly original at all, is that as the United States continued to expand westward in the period between the ratification of the Constitution and the Civil War, each westward expansion destabilized to a greater extent the Union because of the debate about whether the newly acquired territory would become slave state or free state, and hence, the compromises that were made to preserve the Union were quasi-constitutional compromises committed to the preservation of slavery that reified, reaffirmed, and reestablished the original compromise over slavery. So the Missouri Compromise is the most famous, but there were other compromises in the 1830s, 1840s, and even early 1850s that purported to effectively preserve slavery. I go on to argue in the book that up to the moment when he became president, including his first inaugural address, Lincoln was himself openly, formally, and officially committed to the preservation of slavery under the Constitution. That is, that Lincoln himself was a strong supporter of this compromised Constitution. And a centerpiece part of my proof there is his first inaugural address, which if you think about going to the Lincoln Memorial, you can imagine 
there's Lincoln sitting there. And then on one side of him on the wall, high up is the Gettysburg Address. And on the other side of him, high up on the wall is the second inaugural address. There's no first inaugural address. And when you read it, you'll see why. It's because the first inaugural address begins with his statement that the constitution protects slavery and he lacks the authority to change that. And he has no desire to change that. And that again is Lincoln's view right up into the, the presidency. And rem that remains his view until later in his presidency when he breaks the constitution as he himself understood it by ordering emancipation <clears throat> of enslaved people only in areas that are controlled by the Confederacy. So that is to say, not in any place where enslaved people could have the benefit of the order. The enslaved people would have to get up themselves and leave and self-liberate. But if they did do that, Lincoln was saying they would not be returned to slavery. And more importantly, he was saying that there would be no return to compromise at the end of the war. He was making the point that the old constitution of compromise was permanently broken now and would never be restored. And in so doing, I argue, he was breaking the fundamental underlying compromise that had originally been the basis for the Constitution. Now, it took the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to formalize those guarantees. Nevertheless, I argue that Lincoln played the central role in doing so by virtue of the fact that once he had determined and announced that there would be no more compromise, the Constitution was fundamentally going to be broken, and it was going to be devoted no longer to a compromise over slavery, but ideally to an aspirational vision of equal uh, liberty for all people. I also talk about in the book two other instances where Lincoln broke the Constitution as he himself and his contemporaries understood it. One, the decision to go to war, which we have come to imagine to be natural, but was actually not viewed by Lincoln's contemporaries, including by his predecessor, James Buchanan, and his attorney general, Jeremiah Black, as lawful or constitutional at all. And also in the suspension of habeas corpus, which Lincoln did unilaterally with no real authorization from the Constitution and which Lincoln then used to suppress freedom of the press and freedom of speech to an extraordinary degree that we've basically neglected in our history. Somewhere between 15 and 40,000 people were arrested and detained for lengthy periods of time in most instances without trial, without criminal charge um, during, uh, during the period of the Civil War. Finally, um, in the conclusion to the book, I make the point that it's not as though the Constitution based on equality and liberty of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments was actually implemented in the aftermath of the Civil War. Reconstruction was a serious effort by freed African Americans to establish an order in which they would be able to live full economic and political lives, respected and treated as equals, um, with help from the Northern Occupying Army. But ultimately, the Northern Occupying Army was unwilling to sustain the occupation required for Reconstruction in the face of massive white Southern resistance, including insurgent resistance of the kind that came from the Klan. And in a consequence of that, we got a new compromise, the Compromise of 1876 for short, which enabled segregation and disenfranchisement of black people to last up, up until the civil rights movement, when once again, uh, African-Americans managed to organize themselves, resist and demand the equality that was in principle guaranteed, but not delivered by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So I'll just close by saying, you know, there are serious debates about these issues. I've already been criticized from the right um, by Sean Lenz, a historian at, at Princeton, um, who's a vigorous opponent of the 1619 Project. Um, my guess is that in this conversation, we can explore some possible criticisms from the left, uh, which I'm looking forward to talking to, uh, talking to Nico about. And I'm really eager for a, for a fun conversation. Thanks so much. And I'm also looking forward to the conversation, not in a critical spirit, but in a constructive or reconstructive spirit, uh, <laughs> emulating the period. Um, but so thank you. And uh, thank you for writing this book. Um, it's a brilliant narrative. I love the, uh, and admire the mythology or methodology of the whole project. Um, we have a constitution and a legal system that's built on precedent. Yet when those precedents were created, you know, they were highly contested and they were often normatively unappealing. And so I think that the series of books in which the broken constitution is one of them that illustrate the context behind the precedents that today we find, you know, not only unobjectionable, but unquestioned uh, really presents the question provocatively of 
why we should hold ourselves bound to those precedents uh, when the context surrounding them may be totally different from the context surrounding our current situation. Um, and so it's in that spirit that um, I have a couple of questions that I hope that we can have a back and forth about. And so um, the other sort of book that I was, or, or framework that I was thinking about as I read through the Broken Constitution um, was uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in America. Um, and when he was writing in 1935, most historians who talked about the Civil War breaking the Constitution didn't have Abraham Lincoln in mind. Uh, they had Congress in mind. Uh, and an example that you present in the story includes in 1857 in Dred Scott versus Sanford, the Supreme Court held that black people could never become citizens and that Congress could not ban slavery in the territories. Yet only five years later, in the middle of the Civil War, Congress passed legislation that banned slavery in the territories. Um, and after the Civil War, Congress enacted legislation um, over the President Johnson's veto uh, that made Black people citizens. Um, and so it's that sort of breaking the Constitution that I was more familiar with before reading the story about how Abraham Lincoln broke the Constitution. Um, and I was reminded of a passage in Black Reconstruction in which W.E.B. Du Bois was writing about Congress's legislation breaking the Constitution. And I'll just read an excerpt uh, to frame my first question. The discussion which has raged around the Reconstruction legislation is of the same metaphysical stripe characterizing all fetish worship of the Constitution. If one means by constitutional something provided for in that instrument, or foreseen by its authors, or reasonably implicit in its words, then the Reconstruction Acts were undoubtedly unconstitutional. And so, for that matter, was the Civil War. In fact, the main measures of government during 1861 and 1870 were unconstitutional. The only action possibly contemplated by the authors of the Constitution was secession. That action, the Constitutional Fathers feared and deprecated, but their instrument did not forbid it and distinctly implied the legality of a state withdrawing from the more perfect union. Certainly no one could argue that the founders contemplated civil war to preserve the union or that the constitution was a pro-slavery document. And here, I guess he takes uh, Sean Wilentz's view on that. Yet unconstitutionally, the South made it a pro-slavery document and unconstitutionally, the North prevented the destruction of the union on account of slavery. And after the war, revolutionary measures rebuilt what revolution had disrupted and formed a new United States on a basis broader than the old constitution and different from its original conception. So, so far Du Bois is painting a roughly similar story of the civil war broke the constitution. But what I wanna ask you about is this next sentence. And why not? No more idiotic program could be laid down than to require a people to follow a written rule of government 90 years old. If that rule had been def definitely broken in order to preserve the unity of the government and to destroy an economic anachronism. In such a crisis, legalists may insist that consistency with precedent is more important than firm and far-sighted rebuilding, but manifestly it is not. Rule following, legal precedents, and political consistency are not more important than right, justice, and plain common sense. So I guess the way I'd frame this question for you is, concede that Lincoln broke the constitution in the manner described by you and Du Bois. What of it? Uh, just because he broke the constitution as he may have understood it or as contemporaries may have argued, why does that matter? Um, this argument about constitutional obedience is pretty broadly applicable even today. So one of the um, uh, stories in your narrative includes an amendment proposed by Congress in 1861 in order to foresaw the Civil War um, that Lincoln approved, uh, known as the Corwin Amendment, which effectively would have made it impossible for any future Congress to propose an amendment that would give Congress the power to abolish slavery. Um, Congress passed the amendment, a few states ratified it, but it never became part of the Constitution. But if it had become part of the Constitution, and today in the 21st century, we had a constitutional amendment that banned future amendments from giving Congress the power to abolish slavery, why would we hold ourselves bound to follow it? If the justice of the amendment is no longer applicable or if the reasoning behind why that amendment exists is no longer relevant, what, what 
hold does that amendment or that provision of the constitution have on our current generation? So all of that's to ask is, why does it matter whether he broke the constitution or not? Thank you, that's a deep question with lots of moving parts. And let me try to answer it in the following way. First of all, um, I totally agree that I am more or less, maybe not in every detail, but on board with Du Bois's picture of fundamental constitutional rupture. And um, I also am on board with Du Bois in thinking ultimately that it was morally justified um, and necessary for Lincoln to do what he did or for Congress in the cases that it acted with substantial you know, support for Lincoln in the cases where he, part, where he was still alive at least, um, when they engaged in similar, uh, in similar actions. So that's the first point. Second, when, if ever, should we care about violating the constitution? So here I have a slightly different conception of what a constitution is or what constitutionality is than at least the one that Du Bois hints at when he says, if constitutionality should mean doing what the framers meant. I don't think it ever means doing what the framers meant. I think a constitution is something else. I think a constitution is an ongoing functioning contractual agreement between the living participants in a particular polity to continue to live and operate together under a particular blueprint or framework. And in the case of written constitutionalism, that framework is supposed to be roughly, not exactly, but roughly captured in the written document that they point to and call the constitution as interpreted by relevant governmental actors and non-governmental actors who interpret the constitution. To me, to break the constitution is to say, we no longer have an agreement and we need to make a new agreement afresh. What Lincoln you know, famously in the Gettysburg Address called a new birth of freedom, not the old constitution, but a new constitution. And the first reason I think it's important to say that we broke the constitution of 1787 is that it helps us get away from a false myth that is harmful for us to have, namely that the constitution of 1787 is still the constitution of the United States today. We don't have the same constitution. The definition of a failed constitution is a civil war. That's the definition of a failed constitution. And our constitution failed through the civil war and it was remade into something new. That also matters to me because I think it's apparent, and it was apparent to many people at the time, that the original constitution was immoral in that its fundamental compromise was built on the enslavement of human beings, which most of the people, not all, but most of the people who designed that constitution and ratified that constitution knew to be immoral. You know, most of those white men, many of them themselves slaveholders, knew when pressed that slaveholding was immoral, um, but they drew that compromise anyway. And that, I think it's important to say that we don't have that same agreement. We have some new agreement. Not that that new agreement is perfect in every respect, but it is to some extent a different agreement. So I think that's an important symbolic point um, to say that we don't have the same one. Now you follow the question, Nico, to the present. Um, and that's where the really hard part of the question comes in for me, which is why does it ever matter that we follow this constitution? Why not just break it whenever it's immoral? And you use an example of imagine we had a provision like a Corwin Amendment in the Constitution today would be, be, would be appropriate to break it. My short answer is yes. If we had something as immoral as a guarantee of slavery in the Constitution today, it would be appropriate to break it, but it would be valuable to acknowledge that we were in fact breaking it. What I think is that the current agreement that we have, again, an evolving set of understandings and practices um, is in many ways flawed because all compromises, all constitutions are compromises of some kind and all compromises are flawed in some ways, but is not fundamentally immoral. And my own view is that if we wish to live together as a people and as a country, we need to abide by, in a general sense, our ongoing interpretation, evolving interpretation of our constitution, unless we think we wanna break it and start again. And if we wanna break it and start again, we should think long and hard about what's the upside and what's the downside. In the case of the Civil War, it had to be done because the Constitution was based on fundamentally immoral principles. And without breaking it, we were never going to become a country or a nation capable of aspiring, forget about achieving equality and justice, which we haven't done, but even aspiring to it. Today, I think we do have a constitutional framework that enables that aspiration. It's very limited in certain respects with respect to accomplishing it. And then we can have an argument about is our current constitutional arrangement fundamentally immoral in a way that demands that it be broken, or it could just be failing, even if it weren't fundamentally immoral. 
And again, we'd have to have a debate about whether it's fundamentally failing. My own view is that our constitution is under pressure right now, and it almost failed under Donald Trump. But I, my view is that it didn't fail. And there actually were substantial upsides to having the constitution that we have. And Donald Trump's presidency shows those. It shows you that at a moment where you have a president with deep disrespect for the rule of law, deep disrespect for institutions, someone who seems to have been totally willing to overthrow the results of a democratic election, it was helpful to have an agreed upon framework which survived. I'm not saying it survived with flying colors, but it survived. He lost the election and he then had to leave office, notwithstanding his desire to remain. And that is a significant accomplishment. In my view, it's an accomplishment of our constitution. Can I press you on the definition of a constitution that you're offering? So when you say that a constitution is a contract between, are you, are you saying it's a contract between the living generation and previous generations? No, I'm saying that it's a kind of agreement among the people who are alive today um, for the ongoing way that they will um, govern our polity together and collectively. So, so yeah, go ahead. Okay, so but so taking that as the definition of a constitution, if previous generations determine how the current generation can amend that agreement, or the previous generation leaves an insufficient opportunity for the current generation to renegotiate that agreement, then what is the current generation supposed to do if it wants to change the terms of the agreement without breaking it? In other words, you know, one, one uh, sort of problem presented by the modern Corwin Amendment is not just the Constitution protecting slavery, but specifically banning future generations from amending it. And so to the extent that it matters that Abraham Lincoln broke the Constitution doesn't it also matter what opportunities were available to his generation to comply with the constitution while changing it? So unamendable constitutional provisions are a feature that almost all constitution drafters occasionally advert to. Um, and I think they're almost always a terrible idea because what they do is they leave it to the later generation to say, if we really need to change this, we're forced to break the whole thing and it's costly to break the whole thing but they sometimes need to be broken. So an unamendable amendment is also something that you're really afraid is going to be amended. That's why you're trying to make it unamendable. Um, and that means you're trying to lock in for the future. You're trying to exercise the dead hand of the past. And what contemporary constitution makers, or constitution interpreters then always do is either they interpret away the unamendability or they break the constitution if it's fundamentally necessary for it to change. In the US system, we have relatively few unamendable provisions. And so what we've done is radically reinterpreted our constitution through custom practice, Supreme Court precedent and other mechanisms, but the Supreme Court has been really important in this through the idea of living constitutionalism, which as you know, is something that I embrace. We've reinterpreted the principles of the constitution. So they mean things much more inclusive and powerful than the things that they were originally thought of as meaning. And I think, I personally think that's a good thing. We do run into some problems. So the closest we have to an unamendable provision in our current constitution is the Senate. Um, the, size, the fact that the Senate is wildly undemocratic by virtue of the fact that small states and big states get the same number of two. This was known to be undemocratic from day one. Madison uh, actually left the constitutional convention. You know, here Madison should have been really happy when he left the constitutional convention. You know, he had designed this constitution, proposed it and got most of what he wanted through the convention. And he was miserable when he left because of the Senate, because he was trying to design a democratic republic. And he knew that the Senate was fundamentally undemocratic. And even though the ratio of size between California today and Rhode Island today is bigger than the ratio between Virginia and Rhode Island in 1787, it's not unimaginably bigger. I think it was close to 35 or 40 times a disparity already at the, in, the, in 1787. So that's a feature that is it's undemocratic. And the question is, does it render our system fundamentally illegitimate? And I think reasonable people could differ about that. Um, my view is that it doesn't because the Supreme Court, which is also an unelected body, is also counter-majoritarian. Um, and I don't think it renders us morally illegitimate. It renders us less democratic, for sure. And the Senate also renders us less, less democratic. But I, I think when people say, no, our system is fundamentally unjust because of the Electoral College and the um, and because of the Senate, that's a reasonable view that are, what we have to talk about and consider. And it can be measured, at least in part, against you know, how many times does that Senate majority block 
what would have been legislation that would have been transformative and would have been passed. How many times does the Electoral College thwart the results of the democratically elected you know, president? And if it keeps on doing it more and more, that will ultimately lead us to conclude that we have to break the Electoral College. And you can imagine it might even tell us we need to break the Senate, which would require us to break an effectively unamendable part of the Constitution. So uh, I, I, this, this translates into, I guess, my follow-up for breaking the Constitution and what you mean. So the argument of the book is that Lincoln broke the Constitution. And I guess the way of framing this question is, did he actually break the Constitution or did he just reinterpret it in the same manner as a living constitutionalist might today? Um, I guess another way of framing this question is, do living constitutionalists or just you know anyone who interprets the Constitution, do they break the Constitution every time they interpret it in a manner that's inconsistent with past understandings. And to supply a little bit more context to this question, uh, one thing that I found striking about your book is that it illustrates how much we think of as constitutional is really statutory. So what you describe as the compromised constitution that preceded the Civil War is a constitution in the British sense, in that it turns on key statutes like the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, or the Missouri Compromise of 1820, or the Compromise of 1850. Um, you know, even if uh, I, I think of the Constitution as being a document that, at the very least, allowed slavery to continue, uh, I would not regard it as an anti-slavery document by any means. Yet, the Fugitive Slave Clause in the Constitution is not what required Congress to authorize the kidnapping of Black people and sending them south before the Civil War. Congress enacted legislation to do that. And that legislation, like the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 or 1850, um, might be regarded as part of what you're describing as the compromised constitution. Uh, but an important distinction, I think, is that statutes can be amended. It only takes another statute to either break or just repeal a prior statute. Um, and what I also found striking is that many of Lincoln's breaks in the book are interpretations of statutes. So when Lincoln broke precedent and called out the militia at the very beginning of the Civil War in 1861 to fight combinations in the South, um, he wasn't just quoting interpretations of the Constitution made by his predecessor in the Buchanan administration. Uh, he was quoting the Militia Act of 1792, which states that whenever the laws of the United States shall be opposed or the execution thereof obstructed in any state, by combinations too powerful to be suppressed by the ordinary course of judicial uh, proceedings, it shall be lawful for the president of the United States to call forth the militia to suppress such combinations and to cause the laws to be duly executed. Um, and as you write in the book, the Emancipation Proclamation originally conceived, I, I think you uh, persuasively argue that uh, this change, but originally conceived was an, uh, a proclamation that in part enforced or at least broadened the scope of the Second Confiscation Act. Um, a lot of what Lincoln did was either you know, afterward authorized by Congress or ahead of time arguably authorized by Congress. So to the extent that a constitution is built on statutes, like a compromised constitution is built on things like the Missouri Compromise, um, does amending those statutes or reinterpreting those statutes is that the same thing as breaking the Constitution as it previously existed? I think that's a really profound question, and there's a lot of subtlety to it. So let me try to make it less subtle just for the purposes of, of an answer. Um, and let me break it into two parts. First, what do I mean when I talk about a Constitution in this context? And second, how to think about legislation and the manipulation and the, and the working with legislation as a ground for shaping constitutionality, even though in your question, those were beautifully nested together. So I'm gonna to try to answer them separately and then maybe they'll come together. So first, I do interpret constitution in a sense that's a little more like the way we think of the British constitution than the US constitution. And here my working definition is the one that Lord Bolingbroke used. Um, he said that a constitution is principles of reason directed to certain fixed objects of public good um, that compose the general system according to which the community hath agreed to be governed. And that included for him laws, customs, and practices, including legislation, because the British Constitution didn't have a single document you could point to called the Constitution. 
So when I say that Lincoln broke the Constitution at the most fundamental level, I mean two things. At the most fundamental level, I mean he broke the written and unwritten agreement on which the whole system rested. And that included not only the thing called the US Constitution, but also these quasi-constitutional statutory compromises, like the Missouri Compromise, that were used by people, by white people in the antebellum era to reify, reaffirm, and reestablish the compromise constitution. And in that sense, um, the idea that slavery would be abolished in large parts of what Lincoln insisted was still the United States, um, was an act that broke the fundamental and would remain so after the war, was an act that broke that fundamental agreement. And that's the agreement that he pointed to in his first inaugural address, namely the agreement between white Northerners and white Southerners to preserve the existence of slavery. So in that sense, the constitution was based on a core promise um, that was partly captured in the constitution, partly captured in statute, as you say. Um, it was some of each but it was understood by all at the time and Lincoln was breaking it. And that's what Karl Marx meant when he wrote right around the time of the Emancipation Proclamation that it was the most important document in US history. He said, tantamount to the tearing up of the old constitution. And it was tantamount to the tearing up of the old constitution insofar as, as Marx understood that old constitution was based on this core agreement. Now, turning to the question of, and, and for the president to do that then, was to break the constitutional deal that had been in place. And he was not the only one to break it. In a sense, secession had also broken it, but um, this broke it from the other side, as it were. Now, you make a hugely important point, which is that there's a kind of continuous nature in my definition. So official US constitutionalism, the kind that you and I both teach in constitutional law as the law of the land, says there's a difference between the written constitution, which can't be changed by a statute, and a statute which can be changed by a statute. That's the official orthodox uh, doctrine in Marbury against Madison. I am saying, and I think we're agreeing in this regard, I think that a real definition of the US constitution as it actually operates is more complicated. It's not just the thing called the US constitution. It also includes statutes that have constitutional force. And one of the reasons for that is that the constitution is usually not self-executing. It usually needs legislation enacted. So you mentioned the fugitive slave clause, well, the constitution itself requires, it seems, that there be some law that um, enables the return of enslaved people or required. And the legislation enacted was legislation enacted pursuant to that constitutional requirement. And certainly Lincoln described it that way throughout his career. His view was, um, you know, listen, I don't like the fugitive slave clause, but I believe in the constitution. I swore an oath to it. It has the it's in there. And therefore, we, he said this, he thinks the slave states were entitled, his word, to a fugitive slave law to be enacted pursuant to it. So when Lincoln tried to justify his various actions by saying that he was relying on statutory interpretation, I would put that alongside his attempts to offer constitutional justifications for the same actions. So an important point for my book is Lincoln never said openly, directly, I am breaking the constitution. He came perilously close to saying it multiple times, but his preferred formulation was to say, first of all, I have some statutes to rely on. Second of all, I have an interpretation of the constitution to rely on. Third of all, there is a doctrine he said of necessity, according to which as commander in chief, I have to do what is necessary to save the union. And last but not least, he said, I have an oath registered in heaven to protect the constitution, and I have to do whatever it takes to do so. So these were all kinds of theories that Lincoln was repeatedly putting forward. And I guess the way I end up addressing this in the book is to say, it matters that Lincoln said those things. It matters that he never wanted to say he was breaking the constitution, but he knew he was breaking the constitution, each of these instances, because his interpretations of those statutes and his interpretations of the constitution were so extreme and so forced that they can't be taken seriously except as a post hoc justification. And you know, it's a general problem of all legal interpretation. How do we know whether someone is telling the truth when they say, no, 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 I'm following the law, but I'm, you know, but, but really you know that they aren't following the law. It's a general problem, it's a hard problem. And all you can do in the real world is look at evidence of what they said on other days of the week 
and what they said in private letters. And there's abundant evidence of Lincoln up to the minute that he does these things saying that they would be unconstitutional. You know, emancipation is the best example. At the beginning of the war, um, the 1856 Republican presidential candidate, John C. Fremont, who was a general in Missouri, emancipated the slaves of rebels and Lincoln ordered him to reverse it. He said, no, Lincoln fired him, reversed his order and wrote in a letter to his friend, this is just dictatorship, Lincoln's word. So, you know, is it perfect proof? No, because it's not the same day that he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, but it's, you know, a year to the day, just about before he issued his draft Emancipation Proclamation. And he's saying that that act would be an act of dictatorship. So not that it is justified by statute or by other things. Could you draw a distinction? Of course you could. The Second Confiscation Act hadn't been passed yet. There are things that you could say. And in the end, it's an interpretive question as to whether you believe that Lincoln believed those justifications he was offering. I guess I have one final question before turning it to the Q&A, which is to the extent that the Constitution represents an agreement or a contract or a compromise or something involving these, you know, mutual consideration between equals, what role then do people have when they're excluded from that compromise? So is it even theoretically possible in that respect for an enslaved person before the Civil War to break the Constitution? To the extent that the Constitution affects their lives, it, it limits what they can do, yet they, by no definition, are a part of the agreement that set those rules in the first place. To the extent that enslaved people demand, you know, I, I reject the fugitive slave clause and want to join the armed forces, or I reject, you know, the definition of property that would require compensation for me to live as a freed person. Because to the extent that this does not count as breaking the constitution, that this is just you know, people attempting to live in an unjust society uh, while forging one that is more just and treats them more as equals, then I guess I wonder uh, you know, to what extent the emphasis on Lincoln risks limiting the discussion about what it means to break the constitution a little bit too far given how many other people in the era are also doing similar work to forge something different from what followed. And so it's, it's not just enslaved people, I think, that would characterize this, what I'm asking now, but also, you know, Congress, also uh, workers, also women, also all of the people who were yeah. not part of any of these earlier compromises. Uh, to what extent are there actions that repudiate norms that are expressed in the compromise constitution? To what extent are those also breaking the constitution? Or is, is that an irrelevant metaphor for describing people who are never part of the original agreement? I don't think it's irrelevant. Um, so to be clear, and I talk about this in the book at some length, um, black abolitionists, to take an example, free black abolitionists in the antebellum period, some of them made strong arguments for the breaking of the constitution. And they contributed to that process by, first of all, declaring the Constitution to be a pro-slavery document and illegitimate, and by advocating collective action, including in some examples, for example, give some examples, boycotting participation in federal elections on the theory that federal elections were inherently immoral because the Constitution was inherently immoral. So those are invitations to others to break the Constitution by people who themselves were doing what they could to break the Constitution. What you need to do to fully break the Constitution is either have sufficient collective action. So arguably, slave revolts were instances of breaking the Constitution. But unfortunately, in the pre-war era, those slave revolts ultimately were mostly put down. Um, had they succeeded at a larger scale, that would have counted as breaking of the Constitution. And certainly the people who were rebelling were striving to break the Constitution. Had Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, lost the election in 1864, and as Lincoln feared, had the Emancipation Proclamation reversed, he might not have broken the Constitution. He might have tried and failed to break the Constitution. So, you know, success comes from the capacity to shape collective action. And as it happened, and it takes luck, Lincoln's act of emancipation led to, oh, you know, or had, you know, the North failed to win the war after the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln also wouldn't have succeeded in breaking the Constitution, but it led to the end of the war, and it led to a circumstance where slavery was not reenacted, and then it led to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And in that sense, it can be pointed to as a definitive moment of breaking. But I tried in the book, and I think one can, 
point to other people who were advocating for the breaking of the Constitution previously, and who indeed were very frustrated with Lincoln for the fact that it took him so long. And one of the recurrent voices I have in the book is Frederick Douglass repeatedly criticizing Lincoln for being slow and pusillanimous. And it's only when Lincoln finally does it that finally Douglass says, okay, that's good. And he says, Lincoln is slow, he's miserable, but he did it and he's not gonna reverse himself now. And you can tell that Douglass is also just hoping that Lincoln doesn't reverse himself then. So I think that's how, I, and that's how I think about political action more generally in all of my work. You know, I wrote a book on um, the Arab Spring Revolts uh, that was published a year ago called The Arab Winter. And the whole first chapter is about what is collective political action? What does it mean to say that we, the people, um, want something? And my argument there was that individuals reflect their beliefs and values and voices. And when they manage collectively to change the course of events, then we say that they have successfully done so through making or breaking a constitution. That is ultimately an, an act that requires a collectivity. And Lincoln himself couldn't do it on his own. It just so it happened that he was president and that he made this gamble that he'd be listened to. And ultimately uh, his vision in this particular instance managed to be fulfilled. I think we wanted to leave time for questions from the audience. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, thank you both so much for sharing your thoughts so far. Uh, we do have a couple audience questions um, and I do encourage the attendees to use the Zoom Q&A function to submit your questions uh, to Professor Feldman and Professor Bowie. Um, so our first question uh, for Professor Feldman, uh, hello, Professor, how does your theory differ from Bruce Ackerman's living constitution? Well, I, I studied with Professor Ackerman uh, when I was a student, low these many years ago. Um, and I would say that um, taking his work as a whole, um, Professor Ackerman has the view that our constitution was fundamentally changed by the reconstruction amendments. Um, so in that I share his view. His idea is that that was accomplished legitimately via the ratification of those amendments, even though that ratification took place really at gunpoint with respect to the Southern states. I am, um, and he also would not describe that as a breaking because he thinks that was a legitimate um, constitutional amendment process uh, using in that instance, Article Five of the Constitution. He goes further and says the Constitution can be amended even outside of Article Five. My own view is that it sort of strains credulity to describe that ratification process as formally legitimate. And I would see the change as really having been the product of the war of the self-liberation of enslaved people and of the Emancipation Proclamation structuring uh, the events that followed. So in that sense, I have a rupture theory, whereas Professor Ackerman has a continuity theory. Um, in my view, the constitution was broken and was then remade into something new. So that's the way in which we differ. Um, but I certainly am deeply influenced by his idea of constitutional eras and transformations. I should add that I don't think that there was a constitutional revolution of Professor Ackerman's kind at the time of, at the time of the New Deal, but I do think that there certainly was at the time of the Civil War. Great, thank you. Um, so this next question, uh, it does not specify who is it, who it's for, so perhaps uh, both of you may have responses to this. Um, so the next question, is it more dangerous to explicitly and openly break the constitution or to subtly bend it in artificial ways that may undermine its legitimacy while the document itself survives? Well, I think this might be something Nico and I subtly disagree about. So I won't, or maybe not so subtly. We, we were on different sides of uh, testimony in front of the, uh, the presidential commission on um, court reform. Um, so maybe Nico, why don't you go first since uh, I think your view is a very important one and deserves to be heard. I guess this, this gets back to the first question that I asked you, which is if Lincoln broke the constitution, so what? And it seems like one of the things that I strongly, strongly agreed with, sorry, not disagree, strongly agree with in the book is your explanation for why Lincoln would have broken the constitution, that to the extent the compromised constitution was premised on a relationship. So a relationship between white people in the North and white people in the South. Uh, and that relationship was no longer relevant to Lincoln's political considerations in 1862. So preserving uh, the you know, pre-existing relations between North and South is just you know, not tenable in 1862, that uh, Lincoln needs a new reason to adhere to the constitution. And the, link, the reason he supplies in the Emancipation Proclamation and the Gettysburg Address and afterward is that uh, a moral reason that the constitution should be premised on different normative foundations, including one of equality and freedom for all. Um, 
And so I, I, I think that accurate, I think that describes part of your argument. Um, and I agree with that. Um, but so I think that's a sort of generalizable point, which is in asking why should we abide by the constitution? Um, so to the extent the constitution is actually limiting us, like we want to do something, but we think it is not constitutional, which is I think distinct from, we can interpret the constitution to allow us what we want, in which case there's no conflict. To the extent there's a conflict between our sense of justice and what the constitution demands, um, I think it's really difficult to ask why, why should the constitution prevail when it is in conflict with justice? Um, and from that perspective, um, I, I guess my own view is I can imagine, like I can imagine uh, values uh, that obedience promotes, including stability and um, uh, you know, popular sovereignty and to the extent that we, the people have made a decision before I or any of us were alive. Um, but I also value democracy and equality and other values that the constitution compromises. And weighing those two values, I think does not turn for me on, well, one is constitutional and one is not, and therefore the constitutional one must prevail at risk of chaos, but rather um, the, uh, it, it just is a running conflict in the same way that I think the book describes as the statutory constitution or the compromise constitution in which it constantly needs to be renegotiated. Um, and so for me, I think breaking the constitution is uh, potentially troubling, um, but uh, so is being bound by a document that I did not participate in creating that I find is unjust. I guess the way I would put it is I believe in evolution where possible and revolution only where necessary. You know, I would describe that as like a liberal Burkean position. And so when I look at uh, the questioner's point about, you know, when is it good or dangerous to say you're breaking the constitution? Most of the time, if we think that we're capable of sustaining a collective sense of agreement, we're better off evolving the constitution by interpretation not saying that we're breaking it, because what that does is it keeps the relationship in place. The way I think of it is, if you, know, if you imagine a relationship between people, um, you know, the relationship between people can evolve and change over time. Their roles can change, their needs can change, what they give can change, and yet it is still identifiably that same relationship and they gain value and continuity and some degree of predictability by insisting that they maintain that relationship and that it's still the same relationship. But there are times when there's no solution but a divorce. Even if it's a divorce and a remarriage, sometimes there's no escape from it. And that's always tragic, um, even if it turns out, as in the case of the US Constitution, that the Civil War was morally necessary given the original sin of slavery. Now I'm borrowing Lincoln's theological view of this. Um, Nevertheless, a lot of people died in the process and revolution is violent and difficult. Sometimes it's morally obligatory or circumstantially necessary, and then you have to do it and pay the price. The danger in doing that too often is that it's an invitation to the Donald Trumps of the world to say, well, I can break the constitution, why not? You know, Abraham Lincoln did it and he was a great president. You know, when I was writing this book, you know, it wasn't only COVID that was happening. Donald Trump was also president during most of the time that I was writing this book until the very, very last stages. And I was scared. I was scared about making an argument about Lincoln having broken the constitution when the president of the United States was someone who was openly going to prepare to break the constitution, not because we had a moral failing, but just because he lost the election. And so the cost of saying we're breaking the constitution too much is that it weakens the collective sense that we need this relationship to stay together. So I think in this sense, my view is reflective of my general constitutional philosophy. Nico's view is reflective of his constitutional philosophy. I think they're both defensible points of view and they may have to do with who has more faith in human nature. And it may be that Nico has just more faith in human nature than I do, um, uh, which is also appropriate for our different stages of life. Um, I'm, you know, I'm scared that when people start to be overt about breaking the rules, it's very easy for everything to go out the window and for us to lose the benefits of what we call the rule of law, even though I know there's no such thing as an absolute rule that could be self-interpreting. And the rule of law is always an aspirational hope reaching towards something 
that you can't necessarily ever reach. In the same way that Aristotle says ethics is not like we know we're going to get it exactly right. We're not. We're just shooting the arrow in the general direction of the target. Um, that's how I think about the rule of law as well. And that's why I think that when we're able to say that we're participating in constitutionalism by interpretation, we should. And we should only, we should reserve the breaking the constitution for those few circumstances where things are so bad, so fundamentally immoral that we must. And slavery was obviously, you know, a very clear example of where the constitution was so immoral that it had to be broken. Yeah, I guess I guess I think that the danger on the flip side of emphasizing the procedural question of whether the Constitution has been broken um, is or, or, you know, the, the fear that by saying that Lincoln broke the Constitution, it might authorize Trump to break the Constitution or future autocrats to break the Constitution is that I think less important than is the Constitution going to be broken is the substantive justice behind what is the, the person doing. Um, you know, one of the questions that I, I, I teach the Emancipation Proclamation in constitutional law uh, and follow it with um, Youngstown, uh, the steel seizure case in which Harry Truman, uh, without statutory authorization, uh, put uh, steel mills under U.S. control and effectively seized property. Um, and one of the questions raised 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation is, well, doesn't the, doesn't the Emancipation Proclamation serve as a precedent that when the president, when the president seizes property to win a war, in this case, the Korean War, uh, that's legitimate, uh, regardless of whether Congress authorizes it or not. Um, and I think it's actually quite difficult to, on a, as a formal matter, distinguish the Emancipation Proclamation from the seizure of steel. I think the far easier distinction is the way in which Lincoln concludes the Emancipation Proclamation and calling it an act of justice. I think today we can all see that, that, that that is true. It is an act of justice to free and slave people that is far more normatively valuable uh, than the risk of um, allowing presidents to seize property going forward whenever they find it necessary. And I think distinguishing the justice of the breaking, so to speak, um, and, and say that authorizing or treating something as breaking the constitution without regard to, to justice as risking other people breaking the constitution is to set aside what I regard as like the most persuasive reason to support something like the Emancipation Proclamation. And so it matters why Donald Trump is breaking the constitution, I think more than the constitution must not be broken. Thank you both for sharing your insight once again. Um, that looks like we're, we're, we might be out of time for our questions today. Um, so I'd like to thank you on, on behalf of the library. Thank you both for joining us this afternoon. Um, thank you to our attendees for joining us as well. I quickly want to share an announcement that our next uh, Harvard Law School Library Book Talk will be next Tuesday, November 16th, again at 1230 on Zoom. Uh, it's for the Cambridge Companion to Business and Human Rights Law, edited by Ilias Vantekis and Michael Ashley Stein. Um, so please join us again next week. Uh, once again, thank you to our panelists for joining uh, and thank you to our attendees and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Nico. Thank you.